Hi, I'm Carolina Nunes, architect of Urban Ecosystems at Humanitat. In this urban dialogue, we are going to talk about empowering communities and building movements. Our guest speaker is Fred Kent. Committed to transforming spaces in which we live into places we love, Fred Kent has worked with 3,500 communities in 50 countries for over 40 years. He's a leading voice in the placemaking movement, which uses the vision and expertise of a community to create better public spaces. As one of the founders of Project for Public Spaces, he worked in hundreds of projects, including Times Square and Bryant Park in New York, and trainings for audiences such as the Ministry of Environment in Norway and the Dutch Transportation Organization. Today, he's part of the Placemaking Acts, which is a network to accelerate placemaking movements all over the world, and is also working on the Social Life Project, which showcases user-friendly spaces that promote health and economic vitality. Our guest and co-host is Catherine Peinhardt. She's German Chancellor Fellow and guest researcher at DEA, the German Development Institute, Deutsches Institut für Entwicklungspolitik. Her research concentrates on blending social infrastructure into resilience planning, improving urban resilience through public spaces. She worked as project reporter at Project for Public Spaces, telling the story of placemaking, synthesizing the projects and promoting a narrative for building cities around places. Hi, Fred. It's such an honor to talk to you and to listen to your experiences about empowering communities and building movements. My first question to you is, um, there is a gap between people who are prepared to discuss participatory planning, for example, architects and real estate developers, and people who need suitable places to live, such as people in social vulnerability, communities affected by social natural disasters, and so on. In this sense, I would like to ask, how can we bridge this gap? What are the best ways to communicate with the members of a community and ensure their vision comes to life in the public realm? But more than that, considering that our dreams, wishes and demands are based on the world that we know, mainly our real experiences, how can we ensure that the vision of the community is not limited by the influence of developers and other interests? Greetings. Um, I'm here to talk about placemaking and how uh, communities can shape their future. Uh, and I want to start with one big idea, and that is that uh, an architect, actually this sort of surprised me, but uh, Christopher Alexander, who wrote a book called The Pattern Language, had this quote, people are deeply nourished by the process of creating wholeness. Uh, that and uh, and uh, these two people that are in this picture, uh, this woman, this elderly woman walking down a street in Paris has never left my mind. This is probably 30 years ago that I watched her uh, struggle bravely coming down a street with no intersections. In other words, this street was an open street, both sides with retail and cafes and stuff like that. So she didn't have to cross an intersection. So this was her uh, probably daily walk. But when I looked at her, I realized that I wonder how many other people are in their homes who can't come out. Uh, and then I watched these two women uh, in, in Barcelona a few uh, months ago, uh, enjoying their uh, stroll through a neighborhood uh, with hundreds of other people all uh, promenading. And the pleasure that I saw in their faces just, again, just embraced me enormously as to how, who are we really working for? Who are we serving? Uh, the people who we don't see? Yes. Uh, the young, the old, uh, the infirm, uh, the poor, the weak, all of those people are really important. Uh, but what's going on here? And the reason we don't get this uh, this kind of attention to the right people to create that wholeness that everyone really is craving for. And when they have it, boy, are people happy. Uh, the idea of the fear, 
the kind of goals that a community has are narrow goals. Uh, the siloed disciplines are the ones that make all the determinations in government and in the professional world. That the kind of development is sort of project driven rather than place driven, so we're not really getting the wholeness that uh, a broader way of, a, of development can have. Uh, that it's design led by professions uh, rather than place led with a community having a big role. Uh, and the government structure and regulations uh, forces the kind of uh, 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 presentation or the, the, the uh, requirements that disciplines have to be in charge of everything. Uh, and that doesn't work. And so one of the big issues that I've always had on my mind is how do we get around this? And when we first started working, uh, we have this phrase, each discipline has become its own audience. And when we were working, we had to go up against all of these disciplines because they were all focusing on their own agendas. You know, the traffic engineers, transportation people, they owned the streets. Uh, the designers owned the buildings. Uh, and it was the building and the way it was designed, not the way people used it, that became uh, the agenda uh, for them. And they were judged by other people in that same discipline, not judged by how the results were in the communities where they built. And that was often a big part of the failure of communities is that what they were given wasn't, had nothing to do with what their needs were or what they uh, really how they wanted to live. And what happened about 40 years ago, these are the disciplines that we worked on, had to work with. And uh, each discipline was very hard because they all had to be at the table. They all had to have their say. They all had to have to create the outcomes that they wanted. Well, guess what happened? Uh, those, those disciplines have multiplied by, probably by a factor of two to, two to five times. And so now you can't do a project uh, in a city without all of these different disciplines. They're all experts, and they've all been to professional schools. They are uh, high-level, highly qualified people for their discipline, but are they qualified for the people they're working for in the communities? And that's where I think uh, there's a big failure. And so what's happened is we've created all these siloed disciplines, but also these siloed places. So we have all these different places, the community centers, parks, uh, libraries are all in separate districts, different buildings, uh, and each one of them does its own thing. And they don't converge uh, around the common goals or the sense of a larger place. They don't, they don't converge around that. So placemaking has always been our forte, and it's really become more and more necessary globally. And there's a big, uh, there's a really big movement to support this. So it is a, it is a dynamic human function. Uh, it's really an act of liberation, of staking claim, of beautification. And it's true, it's empowerment for people. Uh, and once you get that, you get some enormously big impacts uh, as a result of that. Uh, and what we would say is that when you focus on place, uh, you do everything different. And it's that difference that really uh, delivers the outcomes uh, that we're looking for. And so we came up with these 11 principles. We wrote a book called How to Turn a Place Around. And uh, the first principle is the community is the expert. Uh, and right away, everything changes. As soon as you realize that that's really the, the basic issue that who we're supporting and, uh, and who the real professionals are, it's the community. And that we're creating a place, not just a design, and that they can't do it alone. It needs multiple levels of people uh, working on, on this together. Uh, and there are always people that say it can't be done. I mean, the traffic engineer will say, well, you can't uh, slow the traffic down here, or you can't uh, make that intersection more difficult to turn, or uh, we're, we're not gonna take a lane of traffic out of here. Uh, because the traffic is what drives the economy. Uh, and you can go on and on uh, about that. So what we do is we create a vision with a community, and we come up with these what we call lighter, quicker, cheaper kinds of activations, and they become the foundation for growing that place.
Thank you very much for this excellent explanation, Fred. And now I have a second question to you. There are good practices in urban planning, projects that change not only a square or a neighborhood, but also the city and other aspects such as economic development. But these projects, although participatory, are usually led by governments and you work directly with communities. Can you provide one or more examples of a community-led movement that has changed the city and how they came to be implemented? Thank you. So now I want to turn to a project that absolutely floored me when I, when I actually went to see it. Uh, it's in Toronto and uh, it, was, it was absolutely stunningly awful. Uh, it could not have been worse, and yet it won the Landscape Design Award for Canada uh, about five years ago. Uh, and it's what we call a design-led one. And then, not too far from there, in a park, in a neighborhood that had a lot of difficult uh, situations, uh, crime and health issues, uh, there was another park that uh, a lot of trees and grass, and, but not a lot of good uses. And uh, the person that actually was the one that trans transformed it uh, was about to have a baby. And, uh, and she had to decide whether she wanted to be, uh, whether she should be afraid or uh, scared. And she, she chose scared. And you'll see uh, what happened. So, uh, this is what we would call a design-led versus a place-led project, and they're so different. Uh, it's really astonishing how bad something could be. This is a place called Sherburn Commons in Toronto, near the waterfront, and uh, there, are, uh, there are two sides to a street, and on, on one side, uh, there is this building. No one knows what the building is. It won the Architectural Award uh, in Canada for that year, and it, no one knows what it is. It's a water filtration plant. Um, and, uh, and then right next to that are, is this, uh, or on, on one side there's this uh, park or playground, if you want to call it that, and on one strip of black stones there's one kind of use, and then another strip there of white stones, there's uh, seesaws and swings and some seating. Uh, and what happened, we were there and, and a couple, a uh, family came up and uh, the little kid came out, started playing in this park, but then he realized that, boy, these white stones should mix with the black stones. So he started doing that and his parents got upset and they quickly moved the stones back to where they belonged and they left. And then another family came and there were two older children and there were these two swings, but they were four rows away. And so fortunately with two parents, one parent could be with a swing on one and the one on the other. Uh, but they didn't last long and they left. And then uh, you kind of wonder how they could, how could anyone design something like this? Who was it for? Uh, and what happened is that the designer actually called me because I put it on a hall of shame and said, stay out of my world. You're not a professional. You do not. You cannot say anything about this because it's about the professional, that uh, the professionals that do this, that are the ones that get the awards. Uh, and and you know they chastised me for it, and I couldn't have been happier because I can't think of a worse kind of place that they have, anyone could do. So, uh, but nearby, a place called Dufferin Grove Park, and another neighborhood in Toronto, this woman, uh, pregnant woman. Uh, went into the park, and there were all these what she called tufts, and uh, and they together they built a bread oven, the Portuguese bread oven, uh, and here it is, and uh, it brought all these people from the community into that uh, that place, and they have all these events, and then one group of people actually built a kitchen uh, with outdoor dining, so that people could come in and eat there, and then there was a performance uh, in a little path that had. Uh, hills on both sides, so people could uh, sit on those hills and watch the performance. Uh, and then the playground couldn't have been messier, dirtier, uh, but everyone wanted to be there. And so uh, they had a little pipe where the water came out, and 
So all these activities could actually occur in this place, and it became a true community destination. Uh, so uh, is that good? Yes, of course it's extraordinary, but who did it? It was the community that did that. And another one quickly is working in Detroit. Uh, we were brought in uh, to Detroit, uh, in the downtown of Detroit, and we did a community plan uh, for the city, a, a place-making vision, and uh, they implemented the vision uh, in about four months. We're doing what we call lighter, quicker, cheaper activations, uh, and something like this became this uh, six months after we did the plan, and they put a beach in the center of Detroit, uh, and it brought all the neighborhoods in, became the destination for the whole city. Uh, games were brought in uh, for people to play. Uh, there was uh, markets and cafes, and uh, the person that uh, began to build his identity in, in Detroit, Dan Gilbert, bought all these buildings and created this uh, public space, but it was the public space that drove the outcome. Uh, they couldn't get any retail, so they went with a public space and they made it open and dynamic. Uh, and so the strategy for, for implementing something like this is lighter, quicker, cheaper. You create energy, energetic anchors of activity. You crowdsource the ideas. You make it a movable feast. You get life on the streets and you bring the inside out. And this has become by far the biggest destination in Detroit and it's been part of the amazing turnaround for the whole city of Detroit. So the design-led, place-led, community-led, uh, program-driven uh, are really alternative uh, solutions and directions for how to create cities of the future. Thank you, Fred. I'm really thankful for your contribution and thank you for sharing this. Dear Catherine, it is a pleasure to have you as a guest and co-host in this Urban Dialogue. And I also have a question to you. Urban resilience planning is becoming more and more important in this context of climate change. Many cities around the world are investing in grey resilience like walls and levees and green infrastructure like green roofs and rain gardens. Although these infrastructures play an important role, we can feel sometimes a lack of humanity in this process. People are no more than numbers. The number of people affected by a weather event, the number of people protected after building infrastructures, and so on. Urban and disaster planning are considered a part of community planning. In this sense, I would like to ask, how can we build resilience using the process of placemaking? Why is this important? How can it enhance not only the expected results in the case of disaster, but also the connections between people and nature? What is the role of public spaces in resilience planning, but also in quality of life? Thank you. Resilience is often a term that when people hear it, they think of sea walls or other large pieces of infrastructure that physically protect a community from the impacts of climate change. And while that is a part of it, I think it misses the point where social infrastructure has a lot to do with the way that we react to a shock or a disturbance, whether it's climate related or not. Resilience, just like sustainability, is pretty multifaceted. And beyond being about physical spaces and how they absorb shocks, it extends into the way that communities function and how we interact, whether there's trust. I think that resilience and placemaking are linked because they both relate to or rely heavily on social infrastructure. So public space and placemaking support the social infrastructure where people make these crucial ties to each other, build trust, and learn how to count on each other in moments of need. As a result, I think that placemaking can be a really strong tool for resilience building. To focus too much on hard measures like landscaping choices would be to miss a huge opportunity to cultivate the social side of resilience, and that's where placemaking comes in. To tie that off, I think that right now there's a common thread between placemaking and climate action as communities of practice, in that they both seem to be changing the way that they uh, handle and talk about equity and inclusion as a guiding focus area. For example, the climate movement at large seems to finally be listening to the folks that have been saying for a very long time that climate action can't take place without recognition and action on 
long-standing environmental racism. On the other hand, placemaking is also increasingly about deep listening, drawing on the resources and knowledge of a community while also recognizing its history, especially the harder and more complicated parts of it. The thing about placemaking is that it can strengthen our communities not only on the worst days when we have to deal with a disruption or a disaster of some sort, but also on the best days and normal days when it just creates the backdrop for social life in a city. There are a few things though that I think can help guide the blending of physical and social resilience through the lens of public space. And the first of those would be to make a space useful on a day-to-day -day basis. So to illustrate this, this is a photo of the seawall at Stanley Park in Vancouver, which blends flood protection and spaces designed for walking and biking into the world's largest and uninterrupted waterfront path. Originally, it was aimed primarily at flood protection, but beyond creating what could have very easily been a dead space with an inactive and flood-resistant hardscape, the designers of the seawall created one of the city's best-loved recreational areas that connects destinations throughout the city. So hard resilience here is layered with everyday functional and vibrant recreational use. My second recommendation would be to make public spaces a hub for recovery. So for this one, my example is in Houston, Texas. After Hurricane Harvey, Houston was left with a lot of flooding, and the Baker Ripley Center was quickly transformed into a hub for emergency services and volunteers. Because it was already seen as a place well-equipped to provide community services like daycares and libraries and an art studio, it was able to remain a driving force behind disaster recovery processes. Of course, this mobilization required a lot of strong communication and organization efforts, but it becomes just that much easier when it takes place in a trusted community hub. My third recommendation would be to mix social and physical uses. And for this one, my example is in Toronto. Corktown Common Park in Toronto was a former brownfield site that now does a great job of mixing human and ecological uses of a space. It layers marshes, urban prairies, and underground flood water management systems with paths and playgrounds that people can use. On the physical resilience level, the park structure divides the area into two sections, one where it's designed to flood and the other protected by design, situated on, on top of the slopes of the flood retention structures. But on a non-flood day, all of these uses meld into one cohesive public space that's active year-round. Next, I would recommend that people accommodate the local realities of the climate crisis and tailor their solutions to the real impacts that a specific community will be seeing. And for this one, I want to talk about Hunters Point South in Long Island City. It's a former post-industrial site that has been repurposed as a waterfront space. And it's part of New York City's Sustainable Parks Plan, which is designed to accommodate storm surges through a system of tidal marshes and barriers. These are all features that were put to an early test in the form of Hurricane Sandy. And besides its environmental education programs and stewardship, the park is improving area resilience in that it protects the residents of Queens from locally relevant climate impacts like rising sea levels, stronger storms. It's among a host of other places in New York City designed with sea level rise in mind, among them Governor's Island. My last recommendation would be to meet local needs in a playful way. This one is particularly exciting to me as it's hopefully going to be one of my case studies in my research project right now. And we all know that Rotterdam is in seemingly constant need of stormwater storage, reflected in the city's climate resilience strategy. This is the Waterplan Bentenplein, part of Rotterdam's first climate-proof district. And it's a floodable water square that incorporates seating and open play space, but also doubles as stormwater management infrastructure. There are basins underneath it that are also designed for skating and connected by a system of steel gutters to the city's open water system. So it's an example of incorporating play and resilience in one fell swoop and is part of a wider effort by Rotterdam to turn itself into a sponge. What is the role of public spaces in resilience planning, but also in quality of life? Public space sits at the intersection of so many of today's global challenges, whether it's equity, public health, air quality, or resilience. Our parks, roads, and markets are opportunities for improved quality of life in so many different ways, whether it's through the proven mental health benefits of access to green space or better safety outcomes that come from roads that prioritize human health rather than vehicle traffic. But we have to keep in mind that they can only provide those benefits when they are designed, programmed, 
furnished and managed effectively and with the input of the whole community, which is where placemaking comes in. Having access to public space is something that has long been unequal across cities, so public space benefits often don't reach the folks who live far from parks or are not served well by public transit, and so on. Again, public space and climate resilience alike must be driven by the meaningful inclusion in order to make sure everyone has access to the progress made in either of these areas. Now I have a question for you, Fred. In an era when environmental groups and climate groups like Fridays for Future are growing fast, how do you think the placemaking movement and the climate movement can overlap? So I want to talk about how climate change and the global catastrophe that we're all faced with can be have an enormous uh, benefit by working on communities all around the world. Uh, and that uh, we strongly believe that making communities healthy and successful uh, around broad issues, uh, convergence, uh, sustainability of local food systems, of transportation and preservation, local economies, energy and consumption, uh, resilience, all of these coming together around specific places can collectively have an enormous impact uh, on the future of the planet and the future of every community. Everyone wins uh, and we all uh, can become part of a world that we want to live in, that we can live in, and that will give uh, the planet a future. So if we, one of the most basic things is the gathering place, the central gathering place, the civic square, the public square, they're time honored. Even uh, indigenous uh, cultures would have these gathering places around a fireplace in far off places. Uh, and as cities developed uh, up until the last, uh, till 100 years ago, they were built around a series of gathering places of squares. Uh, then the car came along and the future of cities became around grid systems, which took out those whole, that whole idea of the central gathering place. And we lost that and we have to get back to that. And one of the ways you can do it is just by taking, like this is at Harvard University and this is the, uh, the old Harvard campus. Uh, and for seven, 375 years there was nothing in there and then all of a sudden one day they put chairs out there and chairs of different types so that people could do different things in them. Uh, it was just that simple idea that could, that could turn that around. And then uh, the whole idea of having markets. Uh, you can have a market for repairing uh, uh, computers or uh, uh, your, uh, uh, w your blender or whatever it is. There, all of these things can be done by people who know how to do it, but these markets are time honored, they're historic also from the beginning of time. Uh, and you can take streets. Uh, we, we've lost the whole idea of streets as public spaces, but you can turn them back. In this place in Buenos Aires, it takes the street back and makes a square out of an intersection. Uh, and then you can apply design instead of building objects that win a design awards, you can actually create the, found, the base of a building that is at eye level is an attraction because it's defined by people, not by the architecture. Uh, and you can get really beautiful, uh, beautiful buildings uh, of human scale. And then the whole idea of community hubs, how you can turn a whole library and cultural center into a series of places that is defined by nature and people. Uh, and you can take waterfronts uh, as they become uh, central to the defining a city, places like Porto uh, in Portugal uh, is defined by their waterfront on both sides. Uh, it's one of the most extraordinary uh, public waterfronts anywhere in the world. And you can take uh, cultural destinations and take them out of uh, their buildings and put them in, on the river uh, <laughs> or a bookstore uh, or, or a, uh, a big blackboard and watch people become totally engaged in that and want to be and, and come there on a regular basis. Uh, and then you can take uh, the whole idea of different items or uh, 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 pieces of art and sculpture and that people can come to and roll around on the, on the, the fake grass and climb on the statues. Uh, and you get uh, some enormous amounts of laughter and pleasure and uh, people from different cultures uh, coming together. Uh, and that place becomes sacred in their minds. 
And you can also just with great amenities, you can take uh, seating and flowers and all of a sudden you'll find that that's where lovers go. Uh, so what I close with is we, we, we uh, have this phrase which just really fantastic idea. Uh, if uh, architecture is frozen music, which is what so much of it is today, and planning is composition, placemaking is improvisational street performance. And it's that improvisation, that iterative process of creating places that wanna, people want to be part of, uh, that can really bring about a future that we all want to be part of. Uh, so the idea of these movements coming together around place uh, that is defined by communities, every community differently for its own identity uh, and, and sustainability, we can have a planet that, uh, that is thriving uh, for everyone. Uh, it's inclusive, it's equitable, it's uh, dynamic, and it's uh, a very powerful example, community by community, of a world we can live in together for the future. Thank you so much, Fred, and thank you very much, Catherine. Your answers were very helpful. Sometimes architecture and urban planning are too concerned with the picture, with the photo of the places, rather than how the places will be appropriated by the communities in which the projects were designed for. Similarly, resilience planning is often concerned with hard resilience, while the human aspects are left in the background. And your reflections were really important, bringing people to the center of discussions and placemaking brings this expertise from communities to create better and more resilient public spaces. Thank you very much.